Today on From His Heart, we're in Pastor Jeff Shreve's new series called Future Shock. What in the world is going on? These are timely and eye-opening messages to help us prepare for the soon second coming of Jesus. Join us for the first message as Pastor Jeff reminds us that even though God is going to be with us during difficult days, He never said it would be easy. If you have your Bible, please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy was the last letter Paul ever wrote before he got his head cut off under the persecution of Nero. It was written about 66, 67 A.D. Timothy was Paul's true child in the faith. Paul picked up Timothy on his second missionary journey from Lystra, and he took him with him uh, on his missionary journeys. And Timothy was the pastor in Ephesus. Paul had set him up there. Timothy was a guy who was uh, different from Paul. Paul was a guy who would charge hell with a water pistol. Timothy was a little more timid, and Paul had to tell him, hey, uh, God hasn't given you a spirit of timidity, Timothy, but of power and love and discipline. You have to remember who you are and whose you are, and he encouraged Timothy in the faith. Well, he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3 this, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and avoid such men as these. Hey, well, what's it going to be like, future shock, what's it going to be like in the last days? In the days we're living now, but then in the future, what is that going to look like? Well, God tells us this. He knows the future. He wants us to know the future too. What does the Lord say about living in the last days? Three discoveries. Discovery number one, the days will become increasingly violent and dangerous. That's one of the things that he says. Evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. In the Amplified, we get a, a better feel for what that exactly means. And the Amplified Bible says this, But understand this, that in the last days will come set in perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. That's what we're facing in these last days. Now, the Lord wants us to understand the days. He wants us to understand the times. That's why he said, hey, realize this, understand this. God wants us to know. Now, why does God want us to know? As we read those verses about uh, the 19 characteristics of people in the last days, good night. Sounds horrible. I don't want to read this. I didn't come to church, Jeff. It's for you to tell me how bad it is and how bad it's going to get. Well, I, I'm not. I'm just telling you what God says about the last days. He said, well, is this just designed to scare me? It's not designed to scare you. It's designed to prepare you. Here's the thing that many people forget. The Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. It, it's, it, it, you're called into a battle. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, for we Wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Hey, we're at, we're at war. That's why Ephesians 6 says you better dress for the battle. 
Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. What kind of a soldier goes to battle uh, wearing flip-flops and, and a, a noodle? Uh, you know, he's going to the beach. You're not going to the beach. You're going to the battlefield. And we need to remember that. We're in a battle. And God is saying, this is what's going to happen in these last days. So you need to get ready. Not to scare us, but to prepare us because the Lord wants us to know what's coming down the pipe. And he says it's going to be violent and it's going to be dangerous and it's going to be difficult to say the least. So be aware. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. God wants us to understand the times and God wants us, secondly, to understand man without the fear of God. One of the basic, basic, basic commands in the Bible is the fear of the Lord. We are to fear the Lord. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. We read in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the ABCs. It's like learning a language. What do you, if you're going to learn English, what do you learn? You learn the alphabet. You learn the ABCs. What are the ABCs in the spiritual realm? The fear of the Lord. It's the first button on your shirt. If you miss that button, I don't care how you do the other buttons, your shirt is off because you missed the first button. The fear of the Lord is the first button on the shirt. It's the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge, and we're living in a world today where men do not fear God. Women don't fear God. Boys and girls don't fear God. We used to live in a world where people had a, they might not have been Christians, but they had a fear of God. And a fear of God says that you recognize that God is God and you're not God. You recognize who God is and who you are. I am, in relation to God, a pimple on a flea because God is so great. The fear of the Lord, and we've lost that. And you know what we've replaced the fear of the Lord with? We've replaced the fear of the Lord with the love of self. See what it says in verse 2? Difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self. I'm not going to love God. I'm not going to fear God. I'm not going to acknowledge God. Why? Because it's all about me. It's all about me. That's the world we live in today. We live in a world where people want to be their own God. They've lost the fear of God. Wow. You know what the Scripture says about that? It says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. When you read in Revelation chapter 20 of God's judgment of the wicked, all those who spurned him, all those who rejected him, they come before him at the great white throne judgment, and it is a terrifying thing. It says earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. Nobody wants to be there. There ain't going to be one person at the great white throne who saunters up into the face of God and say, I don't believe in you, God, and I'm not afraid to go to hell. They're going to be wetting their pants at the, judgment, at the great white throne judgment. It is a terrifying terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so God says, hey, in this, these last days, people reject the fear of me. They choose the love of self, and that opens the floodgate, and that opens the sewer pipe of all sorts of terrible, horrible things. Second discovery. Not only will the days become increasingly violent and dangerous, the days will see a rise in false teachers and false teaching. Verse 6, he says, for among these that hold to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men of depraved mind rejected as regards the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, as also that of those two came to be. 
Hey, what's going to happen in the last days? Well, things are going to get dangerous because people are loved, or they're going to be brutal and haters of good, and they love pleasure more than they love God. But then also you're going to have a rise of false teachers and false teaching, and they teach destructive heresies, even denying, the Bible says, the master who bought them. That's why they hold to a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They deny the power of the gospel. They deny the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they oppose the truth. And that's what he says. They're just like he, he likens them to two guys during the days of Moses, Janus and Jambres. You say, who are those guys? Well, they were the magicians of Pharaoh. That's what the Scripture says. Janus and Jambres. Now, we don't get their names in the book of Exodus, but in extra-biblical Jewish writings, we find out about these two guys, and obviously that's who they were because Paul put it in the Scripture. God by, uh, inspired Paul to write about these two guys, Janus and Jambres. And in the movie, The Ten Commandments, if you, if you watched that last week, uh, Moses calls those guys in the movie by Cecil B. DeMille. He calls his magicians Janus and Jambres. And here they are, and they oppose Moses. Well, how did they oppose Moses? See, they hold to a form of godliness. They come across like they're spiritual. But they deny the power of the gospel. You know, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. There's power in the gospel. These guys deny the gospel. But they have power, just as the Egyptian magicians had power. You remember, uh, Moses takes Aaron's rod. He comes before Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, forget it. I don't know who you are. I don't know the Lord. Yeah, I do not know Yahweh, neither shall I let your people go. Who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh? He said, that I should let his people go. And so Moses did a miracle. He threw down Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod turns into a snake. But Janus and Jambres, they get their magical arts going, and they, their rods become snakes. Aaron's rod eats their snakes, kind of as a tip-off. Something's different with these guys. Second plague on Egypt was turning the Nile to blood. That ought to get your attention. But Janus and Jambres could do that too. Third plague that came down the pike on Egypt. Frogs. Frogs. Man, they had frogs everywhere. Janus and Jambres could produce frogs too. Fourth plague, gnats. Janus and Jambres couldn't produce the gnats. Kind of interesting how God put the, the, uh, just the limit on it. You can do all this other stuff. You can't make gnats. They couldn't make gnats. So what did they tell Pharaoh? They said, this is the finger of God because we can't do it. And so, uh, you know, you want to run with God. God's just going to leave you in the dust. So the fourth plague, they couldn't do. Fifth plague, the, the plague on the cattle, they couldn't do that. Sixth plague was boils. They couldn't even come and appear before Pharaoh. You know why? Because they were covered in boils. God has such a sense of humor. Uh, you, these guys are thinking they could hang with God and hang with the miracles of God. They can't. And listen, the false teachers, they might be able to do some stuff because there's demonic power there. But they've denied the true power of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They've denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And they oppose the truth. They stand against the truth. Listen, what do we do in these days? where there's so much false teaching out there. Hey, you say, ah, how do I know who's genuine, who's true? How do I know who's a sheep and who's a wolf in sheep's clothing? Well, Christians must not be spiritually weak and undiscerning. See, it says in verse 6, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins led on by various impulses. Spiritually weak women not talking about they hadn't been to the gym in a while. It's these, are, these are women who are just spiritually weak. They don't know the Word of God very well, and they're probably not under the authority of their, uh, the protective authority of their husband or the protective authority of the church, and so they're sitting ducks. They're just spiritually weak, and they have sins in their lives, and they're weighed down with sin and with guilt, and these false teachers like the crocodile comes into the water. They come without a ripple, and they go after them. 
You know, if you've watched the National Geographic channel and you've ever seen the lions when they hunt, you know, the Bible says that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You watch lions when they go after a pride of, of kudu or some kind of wildebeest or something like that. What, what are they, who do they get? They get the, the strongest, fastest wildebeest? No, they get the one that just can't, can't quite make it. It's like, man, I got a bad hip. Hold on, gang. You know, and it's that kind of deal. And the lion gets him. He doesn't get those that are moving fast with the pack. He gets the weak. He gets the, the ones that can't quite make it. You know, lions aren't saying, well, I'm not going to eat that one. He's weak. It tastes good to the lion. He doesn't care. And so here, how do you protect yourself? How, how do you keep yourself from being um, attacked and duped and deceived by the false teachers and their false teaching? You spend time in the Word of God. That's how. You build yourself up. The Word of God is milk, it's meat, it's food, it's bread, it's what helps us grow. And so you spend time in this book and you spend time under the covering of a Bible-believing church. And you don't get out there on your own thinking, well, I can do this on my own. Uh, that, that, that's not good. You need the protection of the church and the weak women laid down with sins they're outside of the protective covering of the church. I know some people like this. And they're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And they're duped by the false teachers and the false teaching. Now listen, you got to remember something about the devil. The devil is a deceiver. And he is good at deception. The Bible says that if possible, he'd deceive even the elect. Don't ever think, well, he could never deceive me. Baloney, he can deceive any one of us. If God weren't protecting you, you'd be in big-time trouble. Let me tell you how deceptive the devil is. When Jesus came, as we talked uh, Palm Sunday and then Easter Sunday, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he was coming to them as their Messiah, and they received him as such for a very short time until they said, well, you're not overthrowing Rome. Crucify him, crucify him. Jesus said this. He said, I come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. And when the Antichrist comes, the Jews are going to say, that is our Messiah. I mean, you talk about getting it 180 degrees wrong. No, your Messiah came in on Palm Sunday, and you said crucify him on Friday. This is the devil incarnate, and he's the one that you hail as Messiah. Hey, the devil is slick. you got to know this book, and you have to be discerning. That's why it says in 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many have gone out. So test the spirits. You make sure that that person hasn't denied the only master and savior, Jesus Christ. And then discovery number three, the days will require Christians to be good soldiers. Paul told Timothy in chapter 2, verse 3, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Remember what we said? The Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. You're not coming to the Christian life like it's a day at the beach. Bring my flip-flops and my noodle and my floaties because it's all just, we're coming to church just to, just to sing kumbaya and hear about how the Lord loves us. Hey, it's wonderful, and the Lord does love us, but the Lord has put us in battle. And the Lord reminds us, your citizenship is in heaven. You're not citizens of this earth. You're strangers and aliens. And we used to sing that song, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid, are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And that's so true. And so we have the mindset, if we're going to be biblical, if we're going to be wise, if we're going to be walking with God, especially in these last days, we need to have the mindset, I'm in the Lord's army. Man, I'm a soldier in the Lord's army, and I want to be a good soldier. And listen, good soldiers know that it's going to be hard. I know many of you saw the movie American Sniper. 
Chris Kyle, Navy SEALs, Special Forces. Those guys know it's not going to be easy. They don't go into Special Forces thinking, well, what do you got with you? Well, I got my flip-flops. I got my noodle. It's just going to be a blast. They know it's not like that. They know it's going to be hard. And listen, we need to start getting the mindset of a soldier, of a special forces soldier that says, he never said it was going to be easy. And so I need to go into it knowing, hey, in the last days, difficult, dangerous, hard times are going to be there, and I'm going to be ready for those by God's strength and by God's grace. So a good soldier, he endures hardship. Good soldiers don't quit. They don't quit. Did you know that the statistics say that 1,500 pastors quit the ministry every month? 1,500. Some of them because it's moral failure and they're out. Some of them get pushed out. Some of them just get so depressed that they throw in the towel and quit. Listen, I have been on both sides of this because I was in my 30s when God called me in the ministry. You can look at the ministry as... as a, an outsider from, from here looking to the platform, and it can seem like, you know, you hear, always hear the jokes. Well, you guys, you only work one day a week. Oh. <laughs> Listen, now I know working is hard because I did that. Ministry is hard too. It's just hard in a different way. It's emotionally hard, and it's spiritually hard because you get attacked from the enemy. And there's no doubt that a lot of pastors quit because they just get so discouraged they just don't want to do it anymore. And they get people griping and complaining about this and that and the other. Not you folks, other guys, you know. <laughs> but here is a poem. I've shared with you this poem before, but I love it. And you might be here and you might be ready to throw in the towel on your Christian life because you just say, it's just so hard. I want to let go, but I won't let go. There are battles to fight by day and night for God in the right, and I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. I'm sick, tis true, and worried and blue and worn through and through, but I won't let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. I will never yield. What? Lie down on the field and surrender my shield? No, I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. May this be my song amid legions of wrong. Oh, God, keep me strong that I never let go. Listen, don't ever let go. Don't ever quit in your walk with God. It will get hard because it gets hard in battle. But don't quit. And let me tell you some good news before we close. Good soldiers... You know what happens to them, good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ? They experience divine deliverance. Paul said, hey, Timothy, you know the persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And he says in chapter 4, verse 18, some of the last verses he ever wrote, the Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. The Bible clearly tells us what the world's going to be like when the Lord returns. And you know, that world that the Bible describes, it's upon us right now. So here's the big question. Are you ready for the return of Christ? I mean, if He came back right now, are you ready? So many people are not ready. They're not 100% sure. But you can get sure today. You can pray this simple prayer with me and mean it from your heart and the Lord will come in and change your life forever. Just say with me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Jesus, I believe that you love me. So I ask you to come into my life Forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me. Make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in 
and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know what's going on in your life, to know how we can pray for you, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Hey, what is the future gonna be like? Paul told Timothy, hey, it's gonna be hard in the last days in 66, 67 AD. Just think how hard it's gonna be here in 2015. Wow. Why, morally and spiritually, have we gotten in the shape that we're in? When we reject God, when a society does that and puts God in the rearview mirror, they're in for tremendous and terrible trouble. Right is right, even if nobody's doing it. And wrong is wrong, even if everybody is doing it. Get Dr. Jeff Shreve's new eye-opening and timely nine-message prophecy series, Future Shock, What in the World is Going On? Plus, his revealing booklet, How Near is the End? Both resources are our special thank you gifts for your support of $50 or more to the ongoing outreach of From His Heart this month. Just go online to fromhisheart.org or call 877-777-6171. Don't be shocked by the future. Get Future Shock today. Today's single message from Jeff's Future Shock series is also available when you go online to fromhisheart.org or call 877-777-6171 and request the lesson, He Never Said It Would Be Easy. I believe we're living in the last of the last days. I think the Lord is coming soon and so many people aren't ready. Now our job at From His Heart is to warn people, just as John the Baptist did, to flee from the wrath that is to come. Now we're here each week on TV, daily on radio, and always online to sound the alarm and help people come to Jesus while there's still time. But we can't do it without your help. You see, your prayers and financial support of From His Heart Ministries, they enable us to reach millions of people with the critical message that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, the one and only Savior, and He will save anybody who will cry out to Him in repentance and faith. Remember, I take no income from this ministry. Every dollar you give goes directly to reaching more people for Christ. So thanks for your partnership and thanks for your support. I'll see you right here next week and may God richly bless you. From His Heart is the viewer supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love, real hope. From His Heart. Today on From His Heart, we're in Pastor Jeff Shreve's new series called Future Shock. What in the world is going on? These are timely and eye-opening messages to help us prepare for the soon second coming of Jesus. Even though times will be evil as the return of Christ approaches, for the Christian, there is great peace and hope. Join us for the last lesson in this Hope-filled series called Crown Him King of Kings. You know, Jesus told us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we can look out at our earth and say, is God's will done on earth as it is in heaven today? Obviously not. 
with all of the crime and the corruption that we see on earth, all of the immorality that we see on earth. God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven, but there's coming a day when Jesus Christ will rule from planet earth, and then thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jeremiah chapter 23, the scripture says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I shall raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Sidkenu. Lord, our righteousness, and that day is coming. Now, I want you to notice with me seven characteristics of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ when his kingdom comes to this earth. I chose seven because seven is the perfect number, and this is the perfect king on, in the perfect kingdom. So, seven characteristics. First characteristic, there will be no devil. King Jesus will deal with the devil. Revelation chapter 20, I'll begin reading in verse 1. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he should no longer deceive the nation so that he should deceive the nations uh, no longer until the thousand years were completed after these things he must be released for a short time now here's the picture there's the battle of armageddon and jesus defeats the beast from the sea and the beast of the earth, the Antichrist and the false prophet, he grabs them alive and puts them into the lake of fire. He wipes out all his enemies, and then he begins to set up his kingdom. It's known as the millennial kingdom. The word millennial or millennium comes from the Latin, milli, meaning a thousand, and annum, meaning years. So the millennial kingdom is the thousand-year kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And where we get that from is Revelation chapter 20, because starting in verse 2, uh, I'm sorry, in, yeah, in verse 2, going through verse 7, it tells us six times that the kingdom is 1,000 years. And when the Lord begins his thousand-year kingdom, the very first thing that he does is he sends an angel with a great chain and he goes after Satan, and he binds him with a chain, and he opens up the abyss. The abyss literally means bottomless pit. It's the jail cell for demons. And he puts him in the bottomless pit, bound with a chain, puts him in the bottomless pit, closes the door of the prison, and puts God's seal on it, which no one's going to mess with that. That's just a symbol of God's authority. And he should no longer deceive the nations for those thousand years. The devil is a deceiver. The Bible makes that clear. He deceives the, the nations. He deceives the whole world. But during the millennial kingdom, he's not going to be allowed to deceive any longer. And nor will his demonic forces be allowed to deceive any longer. The Lord takes that out of the way. But in that day, in the millennial kingdom that hasn't come yet, the Lord is going to bind him, and there'll be no devil to tempt and to deceive. Second characteristic of this millennial kingdom is judgment. King Jesus will judge the nations. See, that's the big thing. It's like, okay, now he's starting a kingdom. You have to remember something. During the seven-year tribulation period, death, is rampant. It's all over the place. Why? Because the Lord pours out his wrath during the tribulation. And as I've told you before, Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation uh, chapter 18 is the, the wrath of God being poured out. 
and their seals of wrath and trumpets of wrath and bowls of wrath and God is poisoning the water system and God is causing earthquakes and people are dying by the millions during the tribulation period. Then you have the Antichrist, especially during the last three and a half years, he's trying to mark everybody 666 on their right hand or on their forehead and if you don't get the mark, he's going to try and kill you. And so he is murdering people by the millions. By the time Jesus comes at the battle of Armageddon and he wipes out so many people that the scripture says that as he they uses the imagery of him in the wine press and he's treading on the grapes and there is so much blood that's coming up, it's splattering on the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. There's just millions and millions and millions of people who have gathered to do battle with Israel and then with the Lord at the battle of Armageddon who die. But not everybody dies. Jesus said if those days hadn't been cut short, everybody would have died. But not everybody does die. And there are people living on planet Earth when Jesus Christ comes back at the Battle of Armageddon, people who don't die, and then they are going to either come into the kingdom or they're going to be sent out of the kingdom. And Jesus spoke of this when he talked about the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Matthew chapter 25 says this, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separ shep separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Who comes into the millennial kingdom? Only sheep. Only those who are righteous. And the Lord himself will go through everyone to separate out, just as a shepherd would separate the sheep from the goats. So, first characteristic, no devil. Second characteristic, judgment. Third characteristic, it's very festive during this thousand-year reign. King Jesus will enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. John in... Revelation chapter 19, he was told by the angel, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready and it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean for the fine linen is the righteous act of the saints. And he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. And John, when he heard about the marriage supper of the Lamb and he saw what was getting ready to happen, he fell down to worship the angel. And he knew better. He knew you weren't supposed to worship an angel. The angel tells him, get up. To worship God. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Don't worship me. I'm an angel. I'm a fellow servant of yours. But John was so overcome by the glory of the marriage and the marriage supper of the Lamb that it just blew him away. He just had to worship. And he ended up making a, a huge social faux pas when you worship the angel. Don't do that. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, in a Jewish ceremony, you had four parts. You had the betrothal part. Mary and Joseph were betrothed to be married. They weren't married yet, but remember when Joseph thought that Mary was with child, he wanted to divorce her. You couldn't just say, well, I'm not marrying you. I break up. You couldn't do that. It had to be a, a formal divorce. So the betrothal period, uh, it's different from our engagement here in, in our world. The betrothal period was a binding agreement. And after the betrothal period, there came uh, a time where the bridegroom-to-be was working on the place that they were going to live. And then the father would say to the bridegroom, okay, go and get your bride. It's time. And he would come at an unexpected time, come to get his bride, and he'd snatch her away. And there was the consummation of the marriage. And then after that, there was the wedding feast. 
And it would last about seven days. If the father was very wealthy, it could last longer than that. But it was just a huge feast. Well, the picture in the Bible is of that marriage situation. You have the betrothal spiritually where the Lord comes And he shows us our sinfulness, and he shows us how we need him. And when you, when I, when we give our hearts to Christ, Jesus, by his spirit, comes to live inside of us. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is a pledge of our inheritance. He's like an engagement ring. And the Lord gives us the Holy Spirit, his engagement ring, and he says, that's my promise that I'm going to come back and marry you. And we're waiting for him to come. We don't know when he's going to come. He told us, you just be ready. You be ready because I'm going to come at an hour when you don't think I will. So be ready. And so we, as the bride-to-be, we're just waiting. He could come back today. I got to make sure I'm ready for his return. And Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. Just as the the bridegroom-to-be, in an earthly sense, would go and work on the house that he and his bride were going to live in. And the father was the one who would say, it's ready, now go and get your bride. And Jesus said, nobody knows the day or the hour but the father alone. And the father one day is going to say to the son, it's ready, go and get your bride. And that, when he comes, he comes secretly, and that's the rapture. He comes to get us, and he takes us to heaven, and in heaven we have the marriage, we have the consummation of the marriage, and the last step is the marriage supper. And that takes place on earth, and it doesn't last for seven days. It doesn't last for seven years. It lasts for a 1,000 years where Jesus enjoys the festivity along with his bride, along with the Old Testament saints. You know, John the Baptist didn't call himself the bride. He called himself the friend of the bridegroom. The Old Testament saints are the friend, uh, they're the friends of the bridegroom, and we as the New Testament saints are the bride, and the marriage supper, the the feast, lasts for the millennial kingdom for 1,000 years. Then, characteristic number four, you have his reign. King Jesus will rule and reign from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is his favorite place. He loves Jerusalem. He chose Jerusalem. Jerusalem, when David became king, that was a city. It was called the city of the Jebusites. It was the city that nobody could conquer. David conquered it, and David set his kingdom there, and he called it Jerusalem, the city of peace. It's also called the city of righteousness. It's also called the city of truth. The scripture says in Micah chapter 4, and many nations will come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's going to be headquarters. The capital of America is Washington, D.C. The capital of the world during the millennial kingdom is Jerusalem in Israel. That's why that little place is so important. God loves that place, and that's going to be headquarters one day. Now, what will his rule be like? His rule will be perfect and just. Well, when the Lord, the Lord is the perfect king. He is the holy God. There is no unrighteousness in him. And when he sets up shop on planet earth, and it's his kingdom, and it's his rule, it will be perfect, and it will be just. And there will be no broken campaign promises. And there'll be no injustice. And there's no graft. And there's no corruption under the table. It is perfect and just. And his rule will be sovereign. Sovereign, what does that mean? It means he rules everything. He rules everything. He's over everything. Nobody in the thousand years ever says, well, I think I'm going to run against Jesus this election. That doesn't work like that. There are no elections So Jesus will rule and reign from Jerusalem. Characteristic number five, you and I are going to reign with him. King Jesus will allow his saints to reign with him. Revelation chapter 20, verse four. John says, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God 
And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark upon their forehead or upon their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. We had talked about the mark of the beast. And uh, one of the things that I had mentioned, it bears repeating. If you're in this room and you don't trust Christ and you miss the rapture, it's going to be really hard to get saved. But hear me. Do not ever, ever, ever take the mark of the beast. If you take the mark of the beast, you for sure will go to hell. You for sure will go to hell. Because those who take the mark of the beast, they give their allegiance to the devil. They sell their soul, so to speak, to the devil. And it mentions that in verse 4. These are those who did not worship the beast or his image, and they did not receive the mark upon their forehead and upon their hand. And so they rule with him, and we rule with him. And they're glorified, and we're glorified, and the Old Testament saints who are raised from the dead are glorified. And blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. You say, what's the second death? He says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, that the second death is the lake of fire. That's eternal hell, the second death. And so here you have the picture. Jesus comes. And he sets up his rule and reign in Jerusalem, and he allows his saints to rule and reign with him, and it's perfect. We, we don't rule and reign on our own. We rule and reign with his authority and with his mind and his heart, and everything is done perfectly. It's perfect government and perfect justice. And characteristic number six, heaven comes to earth. King Jesus will bring heaven to earth. What's life going to be like during the millennial kingdom? Man, it's going to be so awesome. Beyond anything your mind can comprehend, awesome. Now, one of the first things that happens during the millennial kingdom is the curse that was put on the ground when Adam and Eve sinned, that's removed. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 that the anxious longing of the creation of God awaits eagerly the revealing of the sons of God because then it can be set free from the bondage that it's been in. Do you remember what life was like as we read in Genesis before Adam and Eve sinned? I mean, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. You know how Adam farmed? He just kind of tickled the soil a little bit and everything grew. I mean, it was just like there were no thorns. There were no thistles. There, there were there's no problems with animals. You didn't have to worry about, ah, there's a lion. Let's head for the hills. Wasn't anything like that. You didn't have to worry about animals because animals didn't hurt you. Ants didn't bite. Neither did mosquitoes. I mean, it was just, it just buzzed around. Oh, that's kind of a cool little creature. Uh, there was nothing, any, anything that would hurt. And the Lord says that when he sets up his kingdom, the curse will be removed from the earth. And the prophecy of Isaiah says that in that day, the desert will bloom like the rose. All of a sudden, deserts don't, they're not deserts anymore. They're like the Garden of Eden. Nothing hurts in the millennial kingdom. You know what you have in the millennial kingdom? You have perfection. There is peace and there is joy because in his presence, there is joy forever and everything is just perfect. Scripture says in Isaiah chapter 2, they will hammer their, hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war just a peaceful time. It's a prosperous time. It's, it's a time where the, the temperatures return to what they were during the, the Garden of Eden days, where the, you know, the, in the Garden of Eden, you didn't really have rain. You just had a mist that would come up from the ground and water everything at night. Isn't that great? And you just come out, and everything is so lush and so green and so wonderful. That's what it's going to be like when Jesus sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. And characteristic number seven, it's almost amazing to 
say it, but it's true. There's going to be a final rebellion, and King Jesus will deal with a final rebellion. Verse 7, and when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, just a reference to the nations, to gather them together for the war. The number of them, now watch this, the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now I'll close with this. The Bible speaks of two births and two deaths. First birth is physical birth. Everybody knows about the first birth. The second birth is spiritual birth. Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God. But the Bible also talks about two deaths. The first death is physical death. We all know about physical death. The second death is eternal death. It's death in the lake of fire. The second death is hell forever and ever and ever. And here's the thing. A once-born man dies twice, but a twice-born man only dies once. You determine whether you're going to be a once-born person or a twice-born person. But if you leave this place and you reject Christ and you reject Christ and you reject Christ, one day you're going to find yourself as a once-born person dying twice. And in the lake of fire, you're going to wish you had never been born ever the first time. But you don't have to be a once-born person dying twice. You can be a twice-born person who is raised up in the blessed and holy first resurrection, as it talks about in verse 6. And you can rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. The choice is yours. What are you going to do? The Bible clearly tells us what the world's going to be like when the Lord returns. And you know, that world that the Bible describes, it's upon us right now. So here's the big question. Are you ready for the return of Christ? I mean, if he came back right now, are you ready? So many people are not ready. They're not 100% sure. But you can get sure today. You can pray this simple prayer with me and mean it from your heart and the Lord will come in and change your life forever. Just say with me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Jesus, I believe that you love me. So I ask you to come into my life Forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me. Make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in, and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know what's going on in your life, to know how we can pray for you, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Hey, what is the future gonna be like? Paul told Timothy, hey, it's going to be hard in the last days in 66, 67 AD. Just think how hard it's going to be here in 2015. Wow. Why morally and spiritually have we gotten in the shape that we're in? When we reject God, when a society does that and puts God in the rearview mirror, they're in for tremendous and terrible trouble. Right is right, even if nobody's doing it. And wrong is wrong, even if everybody is doing it. 
you need to get Dr. Jeff Shreve's new eye-opening and timely nine-message series, Future Shock. What in the world is going on? Plus his timely booklet, Turn Out the Lights, When God Pulls the Plug on a Nation. Both resources are our special thank you gifts for your support of $50 or more to the ongoing outreach of From His Heart this month. Just go online to fromhisheart.org or call 877-777-6171. Don't be shocked by the future. Get Future Shock and turn out the lights today. Today's message from Pastor Jeff Shreve's Future Shock series was edited for time, but the entire lesson is available online at fromhisheart.org or call 877-777-6171 and request the lesson, Crown Him King of Kings. I believe we're living in the last of the last days. I think the Lord is coming soon and so many people aren't ready. Now our job at From His Heart is to warn people, just as John the Baptist did, to flee from the wrath that is to come. Now we're here each week on TV, daily on radio, and always online to sound the alarm and help people come to Jesus while there's still time. But we can't do it without your help. You see, your prayers and financial support of From His Heart Ministries, they enable us to reach millions of people with the critical message that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, the one and only Savior, and He will save anybody who will cry out to Him in repentance and faith. Remember, I take no income from this ministry. Every dollar you give goes directly to reaching more people for Christ. So thanks for your partnership and thanks for your support. I'll see you right here next week and may God richly bless you. From His Heart is the viewer supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, speaking the truth in love to a lost and hurting world. Remember, no matter what, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more at fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love, real hope from His heart. Today on From His Heart, we're in Pastor Jeff Shreve's new series called Future Shock. What in the world is going on? These are timely and eye-opening messages to help us prepare for the soon second coming of Jesus. Join us today as we study clear biblical prophecy that declares who and who will not be taken into heaven before the earthly chaos begins. Find out how you can know for sure that you will be raptured. The rapture of the church, it is a doctrine that is taught in the Word of God, but lots of questions concerning that. And people who love the Lord and love His Word can disagree when it comes to the subject of the second coming of Christ. Now, the second coming of Christ is a key doctrine in the Bible. It's talked about in the Old Testament. It's talked about in the New Testament. If you put the Old Testament and the New Testament together and just look for the, the references to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you find one in 25 verses speak of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, it's spoken of 321 times, one in every 30 verses. It's the second most popular doctrine in all of the New Testament, second only to salvation. All Bible writers in the New Testament, the nine who wrote in the New Testament by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speak of the second coming of Christ. In the book of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, it's taught on every single page, on every chapter. It's a very, very important doctrine, but lots of us have questions about it, questions concerning the second coming of Christ. Well, the Thessalonians had questions too, and they were asking Paul 
They were concerned about their loved ones and they were thinking with their loved ones who had died, I guess they're gonna miss this thing called the rapture of the church. So that is what Paul is referencing when he writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter four. I'll begin reading in verse 13. He says this, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. We don't want you to be unaware. We don't want you to be ignorant about these things, about those who are asleep. Asleep is the Bible word for people who have died in the Lord. We don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Now we grieve when one of our loved ones who's a Christian dies, but we don't grieve as the unbelieving world does because they have no hope of the afterlife. So we don't grieve as those who have no hope for if we believed, verse 14, that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The Thessalonians had questions concerning the coming of the Lord. You and I have questions concerning the coming of the Lord. So today we wanna look at four key questions regarding this passage, regarding this uh, discussion of the coming of the Lord that we know as the rapture. Question number one, very basic question. What is the rapture? The rapture is the secret coming of the Lord in the air. Now I say it's the secret coming. When the Bible talks about the second coming of Christ, I believe, as do many other Bible scholars believe, that speaks of two events. There's the secret coming and the second coming. There is the rapture and there is the return of Christ. When the Lord comes in the air and we're gathered up to him in the air, that's the secret coming. That's the coming in the clouds. When the Bible talks about in the Old Testament the book of Zechariah, when the Lord returns at the second coming, he plants his feet on the Mount of Olives. He comes at the Battle of Armageddon in John or Revelation chapter 19. Very clear, he comes to the earth. The the difference being at the rapture, he comes for his own, and at the return, he comes with his own. They say, it says in Revelation 19, that when the Lord comes back, he's riding a white horse, and he has armies with him riding white horses who have been washed clean. That speaks of his own, his bride. So the rapture is the secret coming of the Lord, and in the air is important. Secondly, the rapture is the catching away of the bride of Christ. Now, some people have said this concerning the rapture. They say, well, you know what? The word rapture isn't even in the Bible. Some of you guys, you make a whole doctrine out of something that's not even mentioned in the Bible. You do a a search on any kind of Bible program and try and come up with the word rapture, you're not going to find it. That's true. The word rapture is not used in the Bible. The word that's used in the Bible is the Greek word harpazo. It's translated in verse 17, shall be caught up together. It's translated caught up. Harpazo means to snatch away. It means to uh, seize with force. It's kind of the picture, and the Lord even furthers this by saying he's gonna come like a thief in the night. Harpazo is the picture of a thief coming and snatching away the jewels. He doesn't do it slowly, he does it quickly, and the scripture says that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, it's gonna happen just like that. The the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, snatched away. And it is the blessed hope and the comfort of all believers. This idea that the Lord is going to come, Paul had told the Thessalonians about this. 
And he said in chapter one, he was talking about their faith and he said, I'm so impressed with your faith, how you turned from idols to serve the living and true God and then you're waiting for his son to appear who will deliver us from the wrath that is to come. That's a, a good description of uh, what, a, what the Christian life is like. You turn away from your sin, your idols, whatever they were, and you turn to the Lord, you repent and believe on Jesus, and then you begin serving the living and true God. And while you're serving God, always in the forefront of your mind is the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. He's coming again for me. And it is a comfort. Because Paul said in verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. Hey, are you down and discouraged? You think about the fact that the Lord is coming again. And he's coming for me. It's a word of comfort. Titus uses the term blessed hope. We're to be looking for the blessed hope. And he says the glorious, uh, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. Hey, incidentally, if anybody ever tells you that Jesus Christ is not God and the Bible doesn't ever declare him God, go to Titus chapter two, verse 13. The glory of our great God and Savior. Who's our great God and Savior? Jesus Christ. That's our great God and Savior. But here's the point. The, the idea of the rapture, what is it? It's the Lord coming in the clouds to call us in a moment in the twinkling of an eye to snatch away his church, his bride to himself. In... John chapter 13, Jesus told his disciples some bad news. He said, guys, it's at the Last Supper. He said, guys, I'm going away. They said, so you, you're going away? What do you mean you're going away? I'm going away. It's to your advantage that I go away. They're like, no way is it to our advantage that you go away. Jesus, we want you to stay here. No, I'm gonna go away. And then in chapter 14, because they were so forlorn, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If I were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So what is the rapture? It's the secret coming of the Lord in the air, the catching away of the bride of Christ, the blessed hope and the comfort of all believers. Second question. When is the rapture? When is the rapture? Now, when is not going to be a date because the Bible makes it clear we're not supposed to set dates. We don't know when. And if anybody who tries to tell you when, there are people that have written books. I think it was 1988, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. It was a hot seller until 1989 hit. And then, then not very many people bought the 88 reasons. He came out, I'm told, with another book, 89 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1989. After that, he came out with another book, 90 reasons why I was wrong uh, for 1990. You know, I had one a year, I'm just making that up. But 88 and 89, that was true. And so we're not supposed to do that because the Lord says, you don't know when I'm coming. But we can have an idea and we are told to be ready. And listen, when he comes, the Bible makes this clear. When he comes, he'll come like a thief in the night. When he comes, he will come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. And he comes and there is no time when he comes to get ready. You have to be ready because he comes just like that, quicker than that. The twinkling of the eye is the fastest movement of the human body. He's not talking about a blink. As fast as a blink is, it's faster than a blink. It's the time that it takes for light to hit the eye, the twinkling of an eye. That's how fast he comes. He comes and he's gone. That's why in the clip uh, left behind, we saw those people were just gone, gone, left behind. Their, their clothes are just there. They're, they're just translated out of those clothes. And you could be sitting and talking to a person who is, is raptured before your eyes and you, you, would, you would say, what happened? Well, this person was just here. Now they're just gone, gone, because that's how quickly it happens. You must be ready. But in general, when is this going to take place? The rapture occurs before the wrath of God comes. Very clear. The rapture comes before the wrath of God comes. You say, where do you get that? 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. It says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. We're to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. There is wrath coming on this world, and the Lord delivers us from the wrath to come. You have to remember something. The book of the Revelation, given to John on the island of Patmos in about 95 A.D., he, ta he talks to John, the Lord reveals himself to John, and he tells him, he gives him the seven letters to the seven churches. He tells him the things that are and the things that are going to come. He gives them, he gives John a, a glimpse into the future, a major glimpse into the future. He shows him all these things. Now, if you'll notice, as you read Revelation, the church is mentioned in Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 2, and Revelation chapter 3. The church is mentioned 17 times in those three chapters. Then you hit Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, and John says, and I heard a voice of someone speaking to me with the sound of a trumpet, and he said, come up here. And he was caught up into the heaven. And then he starts to see things in heaven. And then in Revelation chapter 6, we are introduced to judgment. And it comes in the form of first seals. The Lord Jesus is handed a scroll, and the scroll is sealed with wax. And every time he has to pop a seal and open up the scroll a little more, and then it's sealed with wax again, and so he has to pop another seal to open it. And every time he opens a seal, he reads of judgment coming. And you go through all these seals, and they're terrible. They're, they're war, and they're famine, and they're terror, and the coming of the Antichrist. That's the first seal. And so all these things, and then you hit the seventh seal, and you think, oh, we must be done. The seventh seal, he pops it open, and it's seven trumpets, and it's seven trumpets of judgment. And everything, it keeps getting worse and worse, and the seventh trumpet of judgment is seven bowls of judgment. And from Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 18, all you read about is the wrath of God being poured out on this world. And the people understand in Revelation chapter 6 what's going on because they say when the sixth seal is broken and there is an earthquake and the mountains move out of their places and the people cry out and they go into the mountains and they hide out in the caves and they say these words, fall on us and hide us from the presence of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the day of the wrath of their, uh, of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? Revelation chapter six, those people know this is wrath coming from God. And the scripture says when the seventh bowl is poured out upon the earth, it is done that the wrath of God is now completed. Well, the Lord comes to save us from the wrath that is to come. He hasn't destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Well, what kind of a husband beats up his bride before he takes her to, uh, to the wedding? I mean, that would be a crazy kind of deal. No, the Lord takes out his bride before the wrath comes. So when is the rapture? It comes before the tribulation period. Question number three, what happens at the rapture? What exactly happens here? That's a good question. As we've said, the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ himself descends from heaven with a shout. He leaves his throne. You know, when he uh, rose again from the dead, he was with the disciples for 40 days, and then he ascended into heaven, Acts chapter one, uh, out of their sight, and the angel said, why stand you gazing up into the sky? This same Jesus whom you saw ascend to heaven will come in like manner just as he said. He's going to leave his throne. He's going to come back to this earth in the clouds, in the clouds to get his bride. Because the father has said, Jesus, it's time. Go and get your bride. Today's your wedding day. And he comes back and there's a shout of command and there's the archangel that is there and he blows the trumpet and he gathers and it says the dead in Christ shall rise first. So what happens at the rapture? The dead in Christ are raised. 
It says in 1, Thessalon, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that uh, he says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the dead in Christ shall rise and we shall be raised incorruptible. And then will come about this saying, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Those people who trusted Christ, who come up out of the tomb, they can laugh at death and mock at death and say, oh, death, you couldn't hold me. Oh, grave, you couldn't hold me. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is in the future. And then it says that Christians will be with the Lord forever, forever then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We're gonna be with him forever, and it comes at that moment when the bride is called up and we're transformed, and then we're with the Lord forever and ever and ever. Now, the question can be, well, Jeff, didn't Jesus say in Matthew chapter 28, when he gave the Great Commission, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I mean, how is this any different? The Lord has been with us. The moment we receive Christ as Savior and Lord, he's with us. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. That's true. He is with us. But at the rapture, he's no longer with us. We're with him. I told you some years ago about an experience I had when I went to Venezuela on a mission trip. I was leading a mission trip and we had about 16 people going. And so we were flying from Houston to Venezuela, from Venezuela back home to Houston. And one of the guys on my trip was a guy who was a world traveler and he had tons of frequent flyer miles. And so when we were getting on the plane in Houston, he got me, he got himself bumped up to first class and he got me bumped up to first class. I've never flown first class before or since. First class is wonderful. I mean, it, it is just the greatest thing to be in first class. I mean, I'd never been there before. I'm just sitting down. It's just like, man, this is a better seat. I got a lot of leg room. And they gave you little booties. It's like, take off your shoes, put on these little booties, and, and just here's a blanket. And, and what do you want? They gave you a menu, a menu. And uh, then after I ate them, meal was great. I mean, they just can't do enough for you. And then they came by with a hot fudge sundae. That was awesome. First class. When we flew from Venezuela to Houston, John couldn't get the first class going. He got it for himself. He couldn't get it for me. And being the nice guy he was, he said, Jeff, I'm going to sit back in coach with you. Coach is a whole different experience. I'm sitting in coach, I'm getting crammed. The guy in front of me is leaning back. I just don't have any leg room at all. My knees are hurting. Uh, so I stretched it out. And then when the beverage cart came by, it hit me in the leg. Uh, then, I, I, then when they did come, no menu, it was just like, this is what we got. I uh, hope you like it. And I asked the, the guy, I said, uh, he was the, the flight attendant. I said, hey, I said, if you have any extra meals, I said, I, I, I'm over here. You know, I'm, I got a big appetite. He looked at me, you know what he said? He goes, what's the matter with you? You got a tapeworm? <laughs> well, I had just been to a third world country. I was thinking, I hope, hope not. I don't, don't want a tapeworm. Gosh, that'd be terrible. And then I thought about it. I was like, how rude. This guy, does he not know who I am? I'm from first class. I, I just got stuck back here. And Here's the difference. The Lord is with us right now, and all of us live in coach. But on that day, we're going to first class to be with him. So what is the message of the rapture? The message of the rapture is you can't get ready. You have to be ready, and now is the time for you to be ready. I'll close with this story. In a particular city years ago, there was a nightclub called the Gates of Hell. And a man was visiting in this city and he wanted, he had an evening free and he wanted to, to have fun at a nightclub. And so he had remembered that they, there was this nightclub where, boy, there was just 
lots of fun there, and it was called the Gates of Hell, but he didn't know how to get there. He knew he was close, his hotel was close, but he didn't know how to get there. So he's walking in this city, he sees a policeman, and he says to the policeman, he says, can you help me find the Gates of Hell? And the policeman thought for a moment, and he said, yeah, I know where that is. And he told the man this, he said, yes, I know where that is. It was right past a church. And so he said this to the man. He said, go down this street and go right past Calvary. and You'll find the gates of hell. Maybe you're here today. And I'm telling you, you're one heartbeat away from an eternity without Christ if you don't know him. And listen, if you go past Calvary, you will find the gates of hell. But the good news is you don't have to go past Calvary. You can stop at Calvary and you can bow your heart and you can bow your life and you can say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And just as we sang this morning, Jesus saves and he'll save anybody who will cry out to him in repentance of faith. Would that be you today? That'd be you today. The Bible clearly tells us what the world's gonna be like when the Lord returns. And you know, that world that the Bible describes, it's upon us right now. So here's the big question. Are you ready for the return of Christ? I mean, if he came back right now, are you ready? So many people are not ready. They're not 100% sure. But you can get sure today. You can pray this simple prayer with me and mean it from your heart and the Lord will come in and change your life forever. Just say with me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Jesus, I believe that you love me. So I ask you to come into my life Forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me. Make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know what's going on in your life, to know how we can pray for you to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Hey, what is the future gonna be like? Paul told Timothy, hey, it's gonna be hard in the last days in 66, 67 AD. Just think how hard it's gonna be here in 2015. Wow. Why morally and spiritually have we gotten in the shape that we're in? When we reject God, when a society does that and puts God in the rearview mirror, they're in for tremendous and terrible trouble. Right is right, even if nobody's doing it. And wrong is wrong, even if everybody is doing it. You need to get Dr. Jeff Shreve's new eye-opening and timely nine-message series, Future Shock. What in the world is going on? Plus his timely booklet, Turn Out the Lights, When God Pulls the Plug on a Nation. Both resources are our special thank you gifts for your support of $50 or more to the ongoing outreach of From His Heart this month. Just go online to fromhisheart.org or call 877-777-6171. Don't be shocked by the future. Get Future Shock and turn out the lights today. Today's message from Pastor Jeff Shreve's Future Shock series was edited for time, but the entire lesson is available online at fromhisheart.org or call 877-777-6171 and request the lesson, Raptured. I believe we're living in the last of the last days. I think the Lord is coming soon and so many people aren't ready. Now our job at From His Heart is to warn people 
just as John the Baptist did, to flee from the wrath that is to come. Now we're here each week on TV, daily on radio, and always online to sound the alarm and help people come to Jesus while there's still time. But we can't do it without your help. You see, your prayers and financial support of From His Heart Ministries, they enable us to reach millions of people with the critical message that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, the one and only Savior, and He will save anybody who will cry out to Him in repentance and faith. Remember, I take no income from this ministry. Every dollar you give goes directly to reaching more people for Christ. So thanks for your partnership and thanks for your support. I'll see you right here next week, and may God richly bless you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, speaking the truth in love to a lost and hurting world. Remember, no matter what, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more at fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.